Well, joining us today is Ronan Fox, who is the Vice President of IT and R&D at ICON PLC. Welcome, Ronan. We're delighted to have you join us. I'm delighted to be here as well and delighted to be able to talk about the benefits that uh, automation has brought to ICON PLC in, in the past and what we want to do in the future. So how about let's start um, getting a sense of what ICON PLC is, what kind of business it is. So ICON PLC is what's known as a clinical research organization. Uh, so our role in life is to assist and help our, our pharmaceutical um, uh, partners to bring drugs and therapies to market. And we want to do that in a, in a safe way, uh, as quickly as possible, so that we can get benefit of those drugs and therapies to patients as quickly as possible. Fantastic. So what led, what led ICON down the path to automation? So I think it began with the realization that there had to be an easier way. Um, prior to the drive for automation in the business, in the IT area, in my particular group, we were already extensively using automation tools in our software development process to make things easier and more robust. Um, so we knew what was possible technically, and we knew the benefits it could bring to us. So therefore we could espouse those benefits to the business. So from the business perspective, ICON could not continue to deploy resources at, at an increased scale in a growing business environment. As ICON and the market for clinical trials grow, grows, um, it became apparent really that there were simply not enough skilled, experienced people available to do the work we need to do as part of that clinical trial execution. It doesn't scale and eventually it would, it would not differentiate ICON and its services. So from that, um, automation began incrementally in ICON and was traditionally a lengthy exercise that, that the traditional mechanisms of, of automation, integrations, new applications, and so on. And UiPath really provides us with the means to speed up our rate of automation within the business. So Ronan, when you guys got started, um, what sort of goals did you put out there uh, to accomplish with automation? And what were some of those you know, first couple of use cases that you were able to knock down uh, using automation? So uh, yeah, as, as usual, our, our goals were lofty um, and we wanted to do a lot of things. But if we were to look at the key aspects of what determines a success in a clinical trial, these things are effectiveness, um, regulatory adherence, uh, quality and timeliness. You know, those things that will help get those therapies to patients faster. There are a lot of people for whom those therapies will be life changing and the faster we can do that, the better. Um, automation provides the potential to have significant positive impact across all of those aspects of how we execute a clinical trial. And we use that relative, relative impact really uh, to each and measure each automation uh, against those kind of goals to rank them and prioritize them for us such that we focused on areas which we um, recognized might be uh, very heavily uh, intensive in terms of uh, repetitive behaviors uh, that, that our staff were doing in the ways that documents are, for example, submitted to regulatory author authorities and how they're actually prepared for that submission process is a very manual and uh, onerous task really. And it's, it's repeated thousands and thousands of times uh, for any single clinical trial. And that's something that really was uh, one of our first use cases within uh, the use of RPA, particularly with UiPath. So Ronan, we are hearing from all sorts of customers and partners that this coronavirus pandemic has been a catalyst for accelerating or even kickstarting automation uh, efforts within their organizations. Um, has it been or how has the pandemic um, affected your business? I think, you know, given that our goal is always to get drugs to market uh, safely and faster, um, we were already on that journey prior to COVID-19. What COVID-19 has done with an icon is to reaffirm our approach. Um, automation is making icon more adaptive and robust to this type of disruption caused by a pandemic like this. And we see significant future potential in the way that we can further automate and, and drive deeper into our organizations to increase that um, robustness and increase that uh, speed and quality that we, uh, we know, know that's so wanted in the market. 
do you have any examples of where you used automation, you know, at the, uh, you know, specifically in COVID related scenarios? Yeah. So I guess COVID has said it kind of has endorsed our approach, first of all, um, and we see multiple uses of different technology, um, you know, being used right throughout the execution of the clinical trial, be that remote working, um, you know, uh, very simple in, in, that, in that extreme, through to automated distribution and transfer of that data um, and data and system interfaces being key aspects to that as well, because what you sometimes might have is several systems that might have required um, somebody to be on site and moving data between those systems. What we found with automation is, you know, you, you actually don't need to have that person on site to do these things. And sometimes providing them with the tools to do that is the way forward. Um, and <clears throat> we find, you know, staying connected is one of the big challenges with an event like this with our staff and our customers. And the key driver is to be able to react at scale with speed um, and to be able to process spikes in data requests and adapt to that as a normal course of business. It is the new normal. Um, providing automated means of communication updates. So for example, if there are status updates, very simple things that we can provide by gathering data, by using uh, UiPath, for example, to pull data from uh, uh, various data sources into uh, data warehouses or into uh, even small reporting mechanisms that we can use to show our staff and show our customers where they are in the process and so that they are aware and they can actually see what how their own work is contributing to the customer success as well. Ronan, you mentioned speed and we're hearing uh, or we're learning that speed is considered incredibly important, even, especially now. Um, mm. Can you tell, talk a little bit more about speed and its importance? If I was to term it a little bit differently, I would say adaptability is becoming more and more the focus and uh, agility within the business uh, to be able mm. to turn on a dime and have the systems in place and the automation in place to allow us to react in a timely manner. So in a way, yes, it is speed, but it's, it's how you react to the changes in the market and changes in the environment that are really um, what, you know, what we find automation being really useful for. So what is it about RPA that gives you that agility that maybe you didn't have before with other technologies? I'm curious. I, I think it engages with the business more quickly. Uh, I think the business get it. And um, sometimes when you talk automation to a business owner or a, 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 somebody who's working in the business, even as a, an operator, you know, it's all hidden. It tends to be somewhere in the background, all this automation happens. Whereas with RPA and UiPath, what we find is that it's much more intuitive um, and something they can engage with and something they can actually see the benefit of from their own personal per, uh, perspective. Because as I said, sometimes it's there in the background. It's not really it's not really part of how they work, but when you actually show them, this is what uh, UiPath can do, this is what RPA can do, it actually makes sense to them in a, in a more visceral way, in a more personal way, that they can see how their own jobs can be positively impacted with, with automation by, by doing the things they do repeatedly in a day, by freeing them up to do more interesting things and, and getting them bought into the, the practice enables that future agility as well, because what it does in a way um, is empower the employee, empower, um, empower the business to start thinking about automation, to start thinking about what's the next thing I could look at, what's the next interesting um, aspect of my job that I, I can now focus on because I'm not doing that repetitive work anymore. Yeah, and I think um, <clears throat> when we ask, you know, how has, how has the coronavirus impacted your view of, of, of automation, we hear the speed agility side and we also hear an increased desire to uh, to increase business resiliency. Um, is yes. that something that that Icon has been looking at? And if so, you know, what, how have you been investigating that? Yeah, and, and they're both hand in hand, in my my opinion. Resiliency goes with business agility, um, and I think automation allows us to react to any crisis in a structured way and quickly. Um, it it provides or enables that resilience through providing a framework to identify bottlenecks and risks across the organization. Um, now that we've all experienced COVID, uh, we know where the challenges will be if such a crisis was to hit again. We know that travel, uh, an important factor in executing clinical trials, may not be possible due to country, regional, or even site, um, even site restrictions. Therefore, technology generally and automation specifically can help remove some of those risks, 
you know, some examples of that are where we can remotely access information across our partner stakeholders, where we can enable ingestion of data more quickly into our systems, um, you know, automating the testing and the quality of the data and artifacts, and to get that consistency across data sets that might be coming from different parts of our organization, and, and by using automation then to cross correlate and, and ensure the quality of that data in an automated way at scale is something that really provides that resilience for us. Mm. Is, um, is automation a C-level imperative at your organization? And could, could you speak to the idea of the, of the importance of automation to, to the C-suite? Um, I think because of our drive for um, speed and safety within the clinical trial business, automation has been recognized as a key enabler for our business. Um, and to ensure that the strategy and the, the vision that the C-suite and the C-level has makes its way down to the work that we do, we have two members from our C-level are directly engaged in our uh, steering committees for automation as a center of excellence within ICON. Um, and it's important because automation has the potential really to fundamentally change business models, uh, the way we do business, the way we work, and the services we offer to the market. Um, so that kind of positive disruption is fundamental, long lasting, and will reshape, you know, the way we, ICON basically, you know, not just the way we do business, but ICON itself, it will reshape. And it's essential that the sea level is involved so that the vision and strategies and goals make their way down to the week to week prioritization of the automation activities to make sure that we're doing things in, in the right order if necessary and giving the right priority to things to get to those business objectives of agility, timeliness, quality, value to the customer and the things that will pr prove the longevity of, of ICON. I think when we, uh, when we talk to those who are just getting started, that's one of the most popular questions we get is, well, how, how do I know what to automate? How do mm -hmm. I pick the process? Where do I, how do I select that? Can you walk us through how ICON uh, goes through those questions? So at the very start of this process, we cast the net wide within our organization. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, RPA and UiPath were an easy concept for the business to grasp ahead of those more traditional lower level automation methodologies that we would have done in the past. Um, you know, as the, as the pipeline of processes, you know, grew in our, in our, in our backlog, we needed to be able to prioritize them because the business uh, started to push for uh, more and more automation, more and more of, of uh, RPA process that they had identified. And, you know, there's a number of formal methods and we used a combination of them really to figure out which ones to go after first. Um, and really it was in some elements at the, at the early days of this was quick wins, get some marks on the door, get some processes in place that the business that we can point to with the business and say, this is the benefit. This is the realization of that benefit and look what we could do for you too. So, you know, cost benefit analysis is, is one that we would have used to see, you know, how, how much return investment can you get for an automation like this um, compared to the complexity involved in that process itself. Um, another would, would be related to timeliness and quality again, versus that complexity. And it's a balancing match to make sure that you're not trying to boil the ocean, that you're choosing your processes initially, certainly, with care to make sure you are getting low hanging fruit and you're getting that immediate impact. And then obviously there are revenue opportunities that can be had from quicker delivery of, of objectives, quicker delivery of collateral uh, to our customer base and to regulatory authorities. And those three aspects, I suppose, fed into a centralized uh, backlog for consideration by our center of excellence then. Why do you feel that a center of excellence is, is important um, for organizational automation. Yeah. And I, again, this evolves um, as, as the business and the awareness in the organization grows. Um, we began with the ortho RPA as it happens in our center of excellence. Um, and RPA continues with UiPath to be a central um, enabler for automation and ICON. And as we bring, you know, do more and more automation and we use different tools from our toolbox of automation techniques, by centralizing the capacity and the capability of automation within ICON, we basically can get our hands around and measure the impact of it as we go through the organization. We can use it as a mechanism to 
prioritize those activities, as I, as I mentioned. We can raise awareness and articulate the value to the business to further drive subsequent um, automation initiatives with them. So it's, it's, kind of, it's a key catching uh, catch-all for automation within ICON that allows us to group these different initiatives using UiPath uh, and other technologies to, you know, really build out what we call the garden of automation um, that, that, that mm. makes sure that we're doing it in a considered way, that we're not at cross purposes, that you're not trying to re-automate different things in different ways um, and, and basically causing uh, any kind of confusion in the business or in the technologies that we're using. And Ronan, what about um, what about employees? How, how do you involve them in the automation uh, program? It depends is the simple, horrible answer. Um, it, it depends on the group. Um, what we find by democratizing automation, we can do that in areas where the domain skill set and the con what I would call the conceptual capability within that organization, where those things coincided, it worked really well, you know, because those people understood obviously their own domain, um, but they also understood how technology could help them because they were using different traditional desktop tools that they felt were clunky or difficult to maybe automate where, you know, they were relying on macros, they were relying on things that were uh, specific to their own position, but then nobody else could use it or, you know, different aspects of scale um, to do with that. So some, you know, groups we focused on was where we were converting unstructured to structured data and how we could use RPA to help us with that. Um, you know, and, and then others who were maybe working in Excel, working in uh, several different versions of Excel, uh, worksheets, et cetera, and how they were actually trying to maneuver and uh, wrangle the data into a kind of a unified whole for themselves that they could actually analyze properly. And we found those people were particularly geared up and, and ready and willing and um, really wanted automation to help them because they were spending so much time doing repeated tasks that, you know, were basically ultimately prone to error and had to be rechecked and uh, rechecked to make sure that, they were, that the data was consistent, et cetera. Um, so in the regulatory arena, I guess we have to be a bit more cautious um, where we roll out an employee initiative that we need to make sure that we're, we remain in compliance at all times. Um, in, you know, so that if we automate a regulated process, that we can prove that it is validated. Um, and that's a very specific skill set and not, not normally one you'd find in a typical business. But by bringing ourselves on in the IT uh, world, we can actually assist with that whole process in productionizing uh, processes that might have been done as a proof of concept with the business, but we now need to bring it into an enterprise level arena where it needs to be scaled up. It might need to be validated for regulators to make sure that uh, we can prove that the automation that we're doing is doing what it said it would do all of the time. You know, we've seen a number of customers say that they have a vision where their, you know, their employees are going to, you know, ultimately have a robot on their desktop and, and, and work with the robot to, you know, automate away the, the mundane stuff that they do. Um, some, some companies say, well, we're going to have, you know, X number percentage of employees that, that are slightly technically sophisticated give them the ability to build their own robots, let them be citizen developers, let them, you know, build their own automations. They know what their most mundane tasks are. And we want to give them the power to automate those away personally um, with the governance in place. Um, and then there's a large number of, you know, employees that, that are not building their own robots, but they're going to have a robot on their desktop and the robot will be provided to them. And the automations that that robot runs is provided to them centrally um, by a COE. And that's how they plan on fulfilling this vision. Is that in line with your, your view or do you have a different approach? Yeah, I think it's the, the former um, it would be more the approach we would probably take where, um, you know, there are select uh, groups and individuals within groups who are, you know, quite technically capable, who can conceptualize ideas and abstract ideas from the, the physical to the um, abstract in terms of how you would actually go about automating a task. And I think, you know, the mechanism that we have experienced is where those uh, groups and individuals have, you know, proactively gone out and said, well, I want to see how this thing works. I want to take it, take a look at it under the hood and figure out, well, how could I use it? Because surely there are things that I'm doing that I don't have to do as many times or as often or whatever. And what we found is that those people, you know, will go off and look at and, and do an automation, but that they, when they 
in some cases realize that they're not the only ones who would use this process or that they have to have automated to such an extent that it's now a fundamental part of their business that now they think, oh, we can't afford for this thing to fail. So then they will reach out and, and look for that governance and centralization that will be offered by uh, the center of excellence that we provide. And that's where we would look at the, uh, when it comes to us like in a form like that, we would look at the, 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 the collateral really around the automation itself, be it the code, be it any kind of documents that they might've written up or any kind of diagrams of flow of, of data flows or, or process flows. And we would look then to um, formalize them in a way that would allow more than one person understand what was going, what was happening here, and how it would work, and also to remove the risks that, let's say, if a, a citizen developer has developed a what is now a business critical automation, that it's it may be on their laptop. How do we get it into a centralized area that can run either as an assisted uh, a robot or as an unassisted automated artifact, which can then reach out as required to the human via traditional communication mechanisms and the human can step back into the process as well as required. So I do think it's a, it's almost a stepwise flow in terms of, of maturity of thinking within a business that they don't know what they want to automate out of the box. So they want to play with it. And then once they play with it, they make something and the thing that they make becomes very successful and becomes a victim of its own success. And then they want to be able to take it into a, a more enterprise setting where they can further roll it out across a wider group or across different groups within within different business units. We'd like anyone watching to get a sense of, um, to, to actually walk away with a tangible idea of how you can actually start, that to realize that it's, it's doable. So, mm -hmm. um, We'd like to understand, how did you get started at ICON? What steps did you take to, uh, to start on your, your automation journey? So I think this is almost counterintuitive to a technology person like me, but the way we actually started was we start with the most visible form of automation we could think of because our, our business was starting from ground zero in terms of their own uh, awareness. So we, we actually, brought in a physical walking, talking bot called Pepper. Um, <laughs> and we positioned them in various locations around the, com the, the company um, and allowed individuals to interact with that robot. Um, now we programmed it, we set it up, we kind of gave it a list of things that it could say and do and so on. But it, what it really did was it raised the profile of technology in the business and what could be possible in the organization. And it got the business and individuals in the business to engage and think about the potential of automation. You know, surely if, if, uh, if there's technology out there that can do this kind of thing with a, a walking, talking robot, imagine what it could do for my much simpler business. Uh, you know, and, and that's the way we want people to start to think. Um, and then we took it from there and our extended automation strategy then, you know, began at the sea level. Um, you know, even ahead of that bot, the, the real question was, how do we ignite the interest? How do we ignite the excitement within the business to say, this is possible, this is the future. Um, we drove a campaign across the organization polling for one-line proposals. Um, you know, get the ideas out there. Don't spend too much time thinking about them. Just, you know, what process do you have? What do you think could be automated? Just give us a one-line description on it. And then grouping those together, doing deeper dive workshops with departments. And then ultimately across departments, because which obviously what you find in a, in a business like Icon is that, um, you know, your processes are never just one department, it's cross departments. And for an end to end process, you really need to be looking at that value add where, you know, you're getting documents at a, at a clinical site, which could be a hospital. And you ultimately have to get that content into our systems internally so that we can submit them to, for regulatory approval. Um, and I think, that aspect of engaging all the time with the business, getting them engaged, getting them excited, getting them interested in what the potential was there for them. And then we had to incentivize it through goals. When it came down to, it would we'd always come down to that, you know, where your certain goals are set with the business in terms of the level of effectiveness, those, K, those KPIs I mentioned earlier, you know, time to market, quality, um, all those things were, you know, that they were required to achieve um, improvements over what they might have had right now, and then specific benchmarks on specific processes in terms of it's now taking X number of days for this process to execute. 
through automation, we're going to bring that down to half that amount of time. Um, the benefits are there, were there for the business to be grasped. And what was needed ultimately to drive it with them was a set of goals um, within the organization for them to um, achieve. Going through this and, 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 and having <clears throat> achieved a level of maturity, what do you wish you had known going into it? What are some of the things that people mm. should try to avoid? I, I think, um, I would think in our own domain, we had a number of interesting challenges uh, to do with uh, the domain that we're in, where it's very highly regulated, <clears throat> where we want to be sure that everybody understands the process that we're trying to automate. Because when you have a, a COE, a center of excellence for automation, by definition, you have to bring the expertise into the COE to make sure that it works. You need buy-in from the business. You need, um, you know, strategic intent from the C-level is essential. Um, you need, then within the business itself, you need individuals, almost uh, automation ambassadors, call them, within different business units. That will be the points of contact for, um, for, the, C, for the center of excellence when they're looking for uh, details on, on requirements, details on processes, details on benefits, to make sure that we were capturing the, <clears throat> the right process and we're capturing it in the right way. Um, and I think raising the awareness in the business is, is a key essential piece of that. And I think having dedicated, identified people in specific businesses that we wanted to target was a key requirement. And it took a little while, little while to realize the level of engagement that was going to be needed by the business. Just because, let's say, RPA and UiPath technology was intuitive and they could see how, you know, how it would happen, getting them from that point to the point where we had a fully defined process that we could automate was quite a journey and one that required significant investment, let's say, from the business up front to help us along that journey as well, to make sure that when it came to the technology, that it did actually map back to the process exactly as the way they do it on an ongoing basis. And within that, you know, bespoke, uh, regulated process, a suite of processes that we have within um, within the pharmaceutical industry. And I think it's it's essential that you do get down to that level of detail to ensure you get the coverage within your process as well. Um, and I think, you know, from early days, I think it's that aspect of quick wins. I think you do need to define or identify processes which have a benefit, but which are relatively simple to automate. I think there's no, you know, at the very, the very first process you should go after should not be the most complex one in your business that's going to produce a great re return on investment, but could take you an extremely uh, long time to actually automate to the fullest extent. Right. And what you need to look at is modular pieces of processes, something that will actually get it off the ground, show people the benefit, and then incrementally build the complexity, build the uh, maturity within the organization of how to automate and then get a, a flow of requirements, a flow of engagement then with the business in such a way that you do get those more complex value adding processes into the mix as well. Great advice. Ronan, how, how do you create a culture within the organization that is open to, you know, supportive mm. and, and prioritizes automation? I think hey, like it comes down to some of the core values and culture within ICON itself uh, of, of collaboration. Uh, the three that I pick out actually for this are collaboration, integrity, and delivery. Um, and I think they're key cornerstones of any automation uh, initiative like this. You know, from a collaboration perspective, no one person will have all the answers. Uh, and automation itself requires a range of skill sets that have to collaborate from inception through to deployment rollout and subsequent support of that process. Um, I think it also, this idea of integrity is, is essential as well because automating a process requires an openness and transparency from the business and from the technology side of the house to make sure that you know, the goals and objectives and the capabilities and the capacities required for all this automation are actually realizable, that we're, we're being honest with, with each other in terms of this is the process, this is how complex it is, this is the benefit it's going to realize um, at, at an ROI level, but also at a personal level. Um, and then to make sure that people understand what the impact of that automation will be. I think the third uh, culture 
cultural element that I think is essential and as part of the values as well that we espouse is that delivery. You know, we need to deliver in a meaningful way um, where we plan our backlogs where we drive to the commitment made to the business so that we get things done in the in the, the time frames and at the cost that we said we would and ultimately to achieve the benefits that were proposed at the start uh, and that really is if you look at the way we actually prioritize what we do is central to that what is the cost benefit in terms of um be it uh, quality timeliness effectiveness and all of these things that, that go into the mix that try and educate us and try and inform us as to which sequence we should do um, our automation in. You know, ultimately, how will you measure the success of your programs? Are there specific metrics you're looking at and how, just how will mm. you know whether or not it had the impact that you were hoping? So it comes back to the KPIs I mentioned at the very start. Um, ultimately, we want all the automation to be effective. We want to make sure their uh, regulatory adherence is still being complied to, that we have quality, that we have timeliness within our process to make sure those drugs get to those patients in a timely manner so they can get benefit from them. At a very basic, fundamental, technical level, we implemented a, a series of, of basically tickers, which effectively count and measure the value of the automation initiatives we've, we've implemented. So this then provides us with the ability to, you know, provide the business then with a near real-time dashboard of how those automations are adding value, with targets themselves then acting as a means of identifying when action needs to be taken. You know, we might find that or we haven't processed it as much as we uh, we thought we would in a particular month, for example, or a particular week. Why is that? Oh, different data sets are coming in, different types of documents are coming in. How do we now change direction? Do we need to pivot and extend the way that we've done our automation? Or do we need to look at the data itself to see is it, is it still coming in in, in in a consistent manner? And to make sure that ultimately that we're continually increasing the value of the automation we do because you know, if, if something isn't growing, it's dying effectively. And what we want to make sure is that there's also growth potential behind the automation that we do. Um, and we want to be able to show that, you know, even through quality indicators of uh, where we might have outages or where data might be coming in correctly historically, that we want to be able to show that automation is improving the quality of that data um, through either checking the data or even check, making sure that it doesn't get into the system in the first place until it's at a certain level of consistency that matches our requirements. Um, and as I said, that measurement is very important because it adds a feedback loop into all levels of management. Um, so it helps us direct efforts in terms of prioritizing future automation efforts and then understanding if, and if or why actuals may not be matching those targets and providing us with the visibility into maybe reasons as to why uh, it may not be achieving targets at a particular time. Forrester put out a report a couple of weeks ago uh, titled the COVID-19 crisis will accelerate enterprise automation plans. And they stated in that report, one of the lasting legacies of the pandemic will be a renewed focus on automation. Um, do you agree with that? And if so, why? I think yes, the pandemic will focus and has focused minds on automation. Uh, because it improves the resilience of an organization to pandemics and other crises like this that will happen in the future. In the same report, uh, Forrester predicts that automation will become and already has become a boardroom imperative. Uh, why should automation be a boardroom imperative? Automation should be a boardroom imperative because it has the potential to fundamentally change how we do business. Our business is quite a, a human manual based business and requires a lot of human interaction and um, automation aids in that interaction automation augments that interaction um, and has the ability to further in, you know develop the businesses and the, the services that we offer to our customers so we've heard from many of our customers that automation can drive cultural change in the organization how do you think automation can drive cultural change I think it can drive cultural change uh, through making people more aware of what others are doing in an organization by opening up people's horizons to collaboration and um, to opening up their eyes to what it takes to do a particular job. Um, no job is simple. Um, and I think that aspect of increasing understanding and increasing a shared awareness of the values of ICON are ultimately what will make this a success. We've heard 
from the customers that we've been talking to that automation can help drive a competitive advantage for their business. Um, do you agree with this? And if so, why or why not? I think automation can drive and will drive a competitive advantage for ICON. Um, and it comes down to the, the elements of uh, where we use automation for increased timeliness of deliveries, where we use automation for increase, increasing uh, the levels of effectiveness, increases our own business agility, uh, our ability to be able to react and proactively anticipate uh, events such as the as much as we can in, in terms of those uh, crises, external crises that, that will happen, that we know COVID-19 is not the last of these crises. Um, there are going to be others in our own lifetime. You know, we need to build in automation to make ourselves agile, to make ourselves resilient in a way that we can continue to add that uh, value for our customers and ultimately get drugs to market more quickly for our patients. Mm. Perfect. That's a that was great. Perfect ending. Yeah. Um, Ronan, thank you so much for spending this time, for taking the time to spend with us.